All right. Uh, today what we are going to do is we are going to cover a little bit about creating folders. And in fact, driving here, I thought I might as well take a step back and talk about not just creating folders and things like that, but the process of turning your website live. That's something that I don't think is really covered in the textbook. And, uh, but I think it's definitely something that's worthwhile. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend some time talking about that. And as part of that discussion, we'll talk about the creation of folders and that sort of thing. Can anyone, has anyone ever, well, let me, let me ask this question. Has, every, has anyone ever made a website that is put live and is up on the internet? Anyone? Okay. Well, I guess I'm going to have to carry this discussion myself then. No, I'm just kidding. What are, the, what are the steps of doing that? Does anyone have a, a sense of what the steps are? Like, okay, let's say I finished my Lab 3 assignment. And it is so good that the world needs to see it. So I decide I want to put that up on the web so that not just I get the benefit of it and you get the benefit of it, but everyone in the world can see it. What are the steps involved? Need a domain name. And what is a domain? What is a domain or a domain name? Yeah, it's the address. It's like www something dot com or dot org or dot edu or there's a whole there's a whole mess of them. And for some of them you have to have you have to meet certain requirements. Like for example, not everyone could register a domain with a dot gov. On it, only governmental agencies can do that. Um, those like .edu, .com, .org, .net, all those things are called top-level domains. All right, and generally speaking, for most businesses, it's .com. But if you're not really a business, like if you're a nonprofit, .org also works. is also very commonly done. Then again, there's some more specialized ones, like I think .mil for military, .gov for government, .edu for educational, and so on down the line. So you find someone that can register a domain for you. And you think of a URL. Generally, with URLs, the shorter the better, right? Why is that? Well, shorter equates to easier to remember. All right? And it's funny, you can almost tell how long a company has had a presence on the web based on how long their URL is. Like, you know, like Barnes and Noble, I think, is like bn.com. It's like perfect, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, what better could you have than that? All right? Uh, as far as URL names, this, this was not an endorsement of Barnes and Noble uh, or anything like that. All right, but something short to the point is, is really, really, really good. All right, so you, you and, and a set, effectively what that does is that will map your name to a particular computer where your website files live. Now, as far as setting up that computer, that computer is known as your web server. All right. Anytime you hear in IT uh, a statement that you have a server, what that means is the server responds to requests. So what does a server, a web server do? It responds to requests for web pages. So you need also, in addition to a domain name, you need um, a, a, a web server. Now, you could create your own web server having the proper software and and hardware and so on. It's not like it's that hard to do. Or you could hire uh, internet, uh, I don't want to say internet service uh, provider, a web hosting company that would have their machines. Now you can either have shared hosting or dedicated hosting. With shared hosting, you sort of share, like a, you know, you sort of share a machine with other websites. And with uh, dedicated hosting, yeah, there's a machine dedicated to you. And you can probably manage, imagine the advantages and disadvantages of both, right? Uh, dedicated is going to be more expensive, but you're liable to get better performance. A shared server, well, you're on a machine that's actually serving up a bunch of websites. And as such, the performance probably won't be as good, but the cost is going to be less. All right? You could set up your own, as I said, but 
generally speaking, for especially for small organizations, that's not a good idea. Why do you think I say that? It's expensive to maintain, um, maybe. Specifically, what aspect of the maintenance makes me cringe a little bit? Well, it's hard to say. I don't know what makes me a spider. You know, I don't know what makes me cringe. Um, yeah, that's kind of true. I, I would hope that wouldn't make me cringe, though. All right. <laughs> Although, again, people tend to have their specialties, right? I'm not claiming to be an expert in everything. There's one particular aspect that would make even someone that is technically sound cringe, and that is the aspect of security, right? There's constantly hacker attacks and things such as that, and it's not a matter of whether you are capable of doing it or not. It's a matter of it takes a lot of time and energy. You might as well pay someone to do that for you is a thought process that a lot of people have. You know, so as far as patching the operating system, patching the web server software, keeping track of all the security threats and addressing those, that takes a lot of work, right? You as an individual, you're, you know, you're going to spend a lot of time doing that if you choose to go that path of having your own web server. If, however, you contract with a, a web hosting company, you know, that's their livelihood. That's their, that's their job, right? So they're going to, they're, they, they ought to be up on things like that. If they're not up on things like that, then you pick the wrong web hosting company and find another one that is. So either you do it yourself, which is probably unlikely, or you have a web hosting company. And with that web hosting company, you're going to have either a machine dedicated just to you, or you're going to have like a little space on a shared machine. Regardless, we'll call that your web server. That web server has an IP address, internet protocol IP address. And that typically is four numbers that go from 0 to 255. Now, I know they have changed that recently, and there's an expanded IP, but uh, the, I'm talking the old school stuff. Pardon me? IPv4. IPv4, yeah. There's an, an additional version that allows for more. Because if you think about it, you know, you're going to be running out of IP addresses, right? Because not only does every computer on the, in the world that is associated with that has an IP address, but like devices do, and, or potentially do, and so on. So at any rate, this web server is going to have an IP address. And I'm going to just make one up. So don't try to access it because who knows what, this probably belongs to someone who knows what site it is. Maybe my IP address is 135.27.40.0. Maybe that's an IP address. Now, Someone's going to want to type that in to their browser. No, you're never going to remember that. That's where the whole domain name comes in. All right? So I would register a domain with a domain name server, a DNS, and that's kind of like the phone book of websites. All right? So let's say I have, I create a site called www.ciss316.com. The domain server would contain information that said things like, I'm the person that registered it with this organization. I have this URL for a certain length of time and so on. But it would also say that this name, the IP address associated with it, is this. So when someone typed in their browser that name, the DNS would provide the IP address so that you could hook up to it. All right? So... That's sort of the basics to get started. Now, once you have that set up, you don't really have to worry about that aspect again unless you were to change your domain name or unless you would um, um, uh, change your web hosting company, change to a different web server. Because they're liable to have a, they're, they're going to have a different IP address and then you'd have to change the DNS server to point to the new one. It's almost like if you moved. All right? Now, 
I don't know how much longer I'm going to be, used, be able to use this analogy, but if you move, for example, you'd change your phone number, right? Nowadays, you don't change your phone number, really. You'd take your phone with you, a mobile phone and all that. But back in the old days, when you moved, you got a new home phone number. Well, you'd have to update the phone directory to say, hey, my phone number is no longer this, it's now that. I guess the same thing still applies with addresses, right? If I were to move, it would you need to update that information for you to say, I no longer live at this address, I live at this address. So if I were to move to a different web hosting company, you would have to let all the domain name ser uh, servers know that, hey, this website now lives at this IP address. And that actually can take a little bit of time, believe it or not. Even in the days of, com you know, you think of computing as being instantaneous, um, but if I were to change my website to be a, at a different web hosting company, the change would not likely take place immediately. The change would take place maybe over a day or two. And what's more, let, let's say I have an old website at one web hosting company, I have a new website. For that day or so transition, a person here might get my new website, a person in Canada might get my old website. Kind of weird, but it makes sense if you think about it. Why do you think that is? Why would, why would if I change my address, one person get the new site and one person get the old site? Any ideas? Yes, but if there, but, but that's true. One person is accessing the old IP, but how could one person access the old IP and one person access the new IP? You're definitely on the right track. Uh, time, zones. time zones? And how would that be relevant? So, um, a certain time to switch over to uh, good, good thought. Um, it, it, might, it, it would relate geographically. It would likely relate geographically, but not necessarily because of the time involved. Well, the domain name server, there's not one domain name server. There are multiple domain name servers, which makes sense, right? Because you don't want to have, the internet would be very vulnerable if there was simply one machine that was a domain name server, right? If someone accidentally unplugged that, the entire internet over the whole world would shut down, right? And that wouldn't be good. So really, one of the virtues of the internet is the redundancy of involved. In other words, there are multiple domain name servers, and there are multiple ways that you can navigate through the web to get from one site to another. So if my browser or internet service provider was looking at one DNS file and someone in Canada's was looking at someone else, uh, another DNS file, it's possible that this one got updated and a new one didn't. All right? It's like a ripple. All right? You know, it would be like updating the white pages but not the yellow pages or like updating your phone number at work but not updating your phone number for your cable TV or something like that you know whereas for a period of time until everyone got your notification some people would have your old number some people would have your new number so this actually takes an amount of time you know the change is made and then the change gets passed on to all these other domain name servers and then eventually within a day or two typically you know, everyone is now pointing to the new address. So enough about that, all right? Let's talk about the files on this. And for purposes of discussion, we're going to consider a dedicated web, web uh, uh, server. But really, it's not that much difference if you're sharing it. The only difference between a shared and a dedicated is if a dedicated web server, you have the whole machine to yourself. A shared web server, you have a portion of the machine. But other than that, it's the same. You're going to have what's called the web server root directory. That's where the files for your website go. Now, on a Microsoft machine running Microsoft IIS, by default, that folder is called C INET pub www root. Of course, you can change that. Um, likewise with Apache, there's a default, something, something, htdocs, 
and it's the name of a folder. But you can change that to point somewhere else. So you have a directory that you're going to put all your files in. How are you going to put your files in that directory? Typically you're going to use an FTP program. What do the letters FTP stand for? File Transfer Protocol. It's a way of getting files from one computer to another. It's almost like uploading files to Canvas, for example. All right, You finish your assignment, you want to send me your files, you go into Canvas, boom, you upload them. All right, It's almost like that. All right, So, I am working on my web page at my work computer, which is sort of out of the flow here. In other words, if I'm working on, on a website, people aren't able to access my computer to view the website, right? Because I'm still working on it. And you wouldn't want people to be able to access it because you're still working on it. When you're done, you'll take the files and using an FTP program or there are sometimes uh, there are things like control panels within web servers that allow you to upload files and so on. But in some manner, you will upload files from your computer to the root directory of your web server. And then they will be available for everyone in the world to access them. So, if I were to have a file called My, my, my home page, let's say my home page is called index.html, which is a very common name for a home page. If I put that in the web server's root directory, people would access it by putting in my domain name, and we'll say CISS216.com, a slash, and then the name of the file. This part of it says, whose website are we talking about? In other words, do I want CISS216's homepage, or do I want CNN's homepage or eBay's homepage or whatever, right? So the domain says whose website we're talking about. After the slash then is the file name that we want to access. In this case, index.html. Now the fact that there's nothing between the file and the domain means that it's in the root directory. So what this says is take me to this server and give me this file that's in the root directory. All right? Now, just as a aside, sometimes you'll notice, if, for example, if you go to CNN or ESPN or Amazon or whatever, you just type in the domain name, right? You don't type in Amazon.com slash index.html. You just type in Amazon.com, and it brings up the home page. What's going on there? Well, the web server software has certain defaults. And one of those defaults is something like, if the person doesn't give the name of the file, assume this is the file name that they want. So here I've given the domain, and I haven't given a file name. My web server is going to say, well, what's the default file name then? What's the default web page name? And since I didn't specify explicitly a web page name, it's going to go to the root directory and pull the default home page name and that way I'll get the page that I want. All right. Now, websites are like any collection of files in that it can get really confusing if they're lumped all together in a single folder. All right. So what you do is you break things down into folders. All right. And that's where we're going to spend the next few minutes discussing how you break things down into folders and how you access things that are in different folders. And I think we've touched on this before, but I'm going to go over more detail today. All right. First of all, you break things down into folders on a website for the same reason you do it just on any directory that you have. You know, 
could you imagine if you didn't have directories on your PC? All your files, whether it be their resume or your vacation photos or your homework assignments or whatever, were just in one giant pile. All right? It would look like the table in my my family room, right, where everything is just lumped in a pile, right, and to find something it takes you a long time to do that. So what is a better way to do it? A better way to do it is to organize. And how do you organize? Well, you organize in a way that makes sense, that allows you to find things quicker. So on your machine at home, maybe you'll have a, uh, a folder for work stuff, all right, where you have all the stuff pertaining your job in there, you know, your your, your resume, your angry letter to your boss, whatever. You have all that stuff in one folder. Maybe you have a school folder and underneath each school, underneath the school folder, you might have a folder for each semester. You know, this is my summer 2015 folder. This is my fall 2015 folder. And then maybe you have underneath those folders subfolders for the different subjects that you're taking. All right? And then maybe you have vacation folders where you have, you know, um, your summer 2015 vacation. You know, you, where you have plans, maybe you put the plans for the vacation in there. You know, like um, when I vacation in, uh, in Elyria this year, what are the highlights I'm going to visit? I'll probably visit the library and, I don't know, someplace else. All right. And then maybe you put your photographs in there in a different folder. The idea is, is there's no right or wrong way to do this, right? You organize it in a way that is logical to you. It's sort of the same idea with websites. Here's what people do typically, especially when there is, it's a small site. You know, not like hundreds of pages, but maybe dozens of pages. They will put all their web pages in the root directory, and so on. Then maybe they will have a folder for their CSS files. File or files. <coughs> and then maybe they'll have a folder for their images. And so on down the line. Maybe Later on, when we start talking about JavaScript, maybe there'll be a folder for the JavaScript files. So you do it in a way that makes sense. And again, this is a way that's pretty logical for that. Well, how then do you refer to files if they're in different folders? We've said examples in the past that if your image is in the same folder as your web page, you just use the name of the file. So if I have a page called index.html and it refers to an image called one.jpg if they're all in the same folder all I need to do is say image source equals one.jpg that means it's in the same folder all right if it's not in the same folder in this scenario if it's in a folder underneath that I need to put the folder name and then the name of the file. So if I have all my pages in the root directory and all my images are in a directory underneath the root directory called image, then I would refer to that file by saying the directory name slash one dot JPEG. Notice you always use a forward slash. Some people think of windows, and with windows you use a backslash, the slash going in the other direction to separate folders. That's not the case on web pages. It doesn't matter if you're on windows or whatever. You're using web rules here, and the web rules are always a forward slash. Now, if I had a different subdirectory underneath images, for example, if I had images slash vacation, then I would do image slash vacation slash one dot jpeg 
and I would have as many directories as I would have in that list. So rule number one for these paths to files is if you're going from one directory down in the subdirectories, you put a list of the subdirectories and end with the file name. There's no slash at the beginning here. You just start listing. So in other words, if I see this, what that's telling me is in the directory that the web page is in, there better be a folder called image, and inside that folder there better be a folder called vacation, and inside that there better be something called one.jpg. All right. This is called relative addresses. All right. When I talk about relative addresses, you know, anytime you say something's relative, it means com you know talking about one thing in terms of something else. So, for example, if I were to give you directions from here to the pot machine downstairs on the second floor, I would say go out the door turn right, turn left, no, <laughs> turn right, turn left, go down the stairs, go down such and such hall, and there it is. Those directions only work from here to there. All right? If, for example, we were in the parking lot and you wanted directions to the pot machine, I'd give you different directions, right? Because you're not going to go down steps. There are no steps going down in the parking lot. You'd have to go in the building and go up to the second floor and so on down the line. All right? So this is known as a relative path. In other words, starting off from where the page lives, you specify the subdirectories that take you down to the file that you want. All right? Relative path. That's typically the path that's best to use. There's another way that you can specify the path of something, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute here. Now, here's an important implication. If you're uploading or you're moving files, from your, if you're uploading like to, to Canvas, or if you're moving files from your development machine to machine to the web server, you need to keep that relative file structure the same. All right? So in other words, if this is how it works on my machine, where I have these subfolders, I have to create and, and, and send the subfolders along when I upload it to the web server or when I upload it to Canvas. How do you send subfolders? Well, the most simple way, as far as Canvas goes, is you would simply zip up the root directory. Because when you zip up or compress a directory, it maintains all the subfolders. If I was uploading it to the server, I would upload the files to the root directory. I'd go in and I'd make an image directory, upload the files to there, make all my other directories, and upload all those other files. The point is, is if I do this, if I set it up this way, and I screw things up, like I put all the images in the CSS folder, or I don't have folders for CSS, and I have everything in the root folder instead, that's going to mess things up, because it's not going to be able to find it then. All right? What is the alternative to an, a relative path, an absolute path? In this case, I could do this. Image source equals HTTP colon my domain name, slash image, slash vacation, slash one JPEG. I could do that. The problem is if I start moving things around in my web server, with relative paths, as long as I move those directories like in parallel, everything's okay. Whereas if I move things in this scenario, the images are going to break. 
What's more, this becomes very difficult to test on my home machine and then upload it to the server. That being said, I did want to show you this because this is an alternative way of doing it. Typically, you're best off with relative paths. Now, the last thing before we get into, um, before we exit this topic is, let's talk about how maybe a larger website would be organized and how the relative paths would work for that. Let's say I don't have a small website that simply has, you know, a dozen or so pages. Let's say I have hundreds of pages. Well, if I have all my web pages in the root directory, again, I got a lot of clutter there. So what I might do is I might divide my site into sections. So, for example, let's talk about LC's website. Maybe there's a root directory. And there's a home page in there. Then maybe there's a separate folder for financial aid. And there's the financial aid home page in there. And all the other pages about that. Then maybe there is a, you know, athletics folder that has its home page for the athletics section and a bunch of pages. And so on down the line. Maybe for um, health sciences, there is a section. For IT, there's a section. And so on. Because really, each one of those sections is kind of like its own little mini website, right? It's all tied together, but, you know, there's, you know, if you go to a section about engineering and information technology, there's a lot of information there, all right? So therefore, if we lumped everything into one root folder, we'd have a mess again. So what we might do is we might create folders for that. Now, how does the path work for that? Well, we have to learn one other thing with paths before we do that, and that is the dot dot. All right? How many of you have had operating systems before? The operating systems class. All right, a couple. Uh, who'd you have for it? Who? Huffman? Okay. Uh, different people. Uh, those of you who had Huffman, he probably spent time talking about like the squirrel, right? <laughs> now, what does that mean? Well, if you think about it, and let's assume this is just a regular squirrel. This isn't like Rocky the Flying Squirrel or anything. All right? If you have a tree that looks like this, which essentially, if you turn it upside down, that's what like directories look like in a computer, right? You got your root folder. And then you have branches off of that. And each one of these branches is like a directory. All right? Now, let's say the squirrel, let me draw a squirrel. Say the squirrel's here and wants to get there. Not a flying squirrel, plain old squirrel. How does that squirrel get from here to here? Well, can't fly across the gap, right? The squirrel would have to go this, have to go to the previous level, and then up to that level. If the squirrel wanted to get to this branch over here, they would have to go down to this, and then up to that. Can't jump across, remember. And it's sort of the same thing with tracing paths. The dot dot says to go to the previous, go to the parent folder. Or if we're thinking in terms of a directory structure, where the directory tree is kind of like an upside down tree, like this. The dot dot means go up a level.
So the relative path, let's say this folder is called ABC and this folder is called DEF and I want to file one dot JPEG in that folder. If I have a web page in folder DEF and I want to access the image in the folder ABC, to do that I can't just jump from here to here. I have to go up, 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 let's see, down, down, and then I can access it. So if I was in a web page in here, index.html, and I want to access this image, I would have to say image src equals dot dot, that would take me up here, dot dot, that would take me to here, dot dot, I'm confusing myself, dot dot, dot dot, dot dot, then down to the first folder and down to the second folder and then one dot jpeg. This really isn't as confusing as it seems or it may seem. All right. And I know that's easy for me to say. It's like the dentist saying it's not going to hurt, right? You know, yeah, it's not going to hurt him. Yeah, this isn't confusing to me. But over time, fortunately, this doesn't physically hurt, all right? So if you don't understand it, it's not like you're going to need to take ibuprofen or anything. I don't know, unless it gives you a headache because you think about it too much. I guess it could, could potentially hurt a little bit. But the idea is, is when you travel through directories using relative paths, you're either going to put a dot dot to go up a directory or you're going to put the name of the directory that you want to get to to get to the subdirectory. So to go to a parent directory, you use dot dot. To get to a child directory, use a directory name. If you think about it, that makes sense. A parent directory can have multiple children directories, but each directory only has one parent directory in this case. So this directory here, whatever it's called, LMN, has these two as children directories. So I have to specify which child directory I want to get down to. But this directory only has one parent. So I don't have to give the name of the parent. I just say go up to your parent. Now the nice thing is, there's two nice things here and here's the two takeaways. The nice thing is, is no matter how complicated this gets, as long as you keep that directory structure, you can copy your files from machine to machine to server and everything will be intact. A hundred directories is no more complicated than one directory as far as that goes, as long as you keep those directories intact. There's really only two things you need to know. Dot dot takes you up a level. The name of the directory that you want to get to takes you down a level. All right. The good news also is that the, the things that we're dealing with in this class for the most part are going to be small enough where you probably only need a directory for your pages and a directory for your images and maybe a directory for your CSS. So it's not like you have to come up with something complicated like that. If you want to do that just as practice, you're welcome to do that, to practice it. But I'll be happy if you do just a couple of directories, like for your final project. In fact, if this really is a problem and you're really struggling with it, talk to me about it and I'll try to give you some, you know, some clarification on it. But really, the size of projects we're working on is probably not even horrible if you have everything in the one folder. All right. So, don't let this be the stopping point. Either, either, you know, either, you know, talk it through with me or just put everything in one folder and then you just need to use the file name. All right? You do need to upload everything now. Like even, I notice even with the assignment. With the assignment, um, some people uploaded like the page but like not the images. The page and the CSS not here. You need to upload everything when you upload the file. The page, the CSS files, all the images, and so on. All right? 
That's why it's convenient to just zip up the root directory and upload that. Develop in this way, using the relative paths. When you're done, zip up the root directory and email it. Two things with images before we, we end this topic. Number one, I should never see something like this. Why should I not see that? Yes. That's it's only on exactly. It's, it's only going to work on the computer that this was done on. Quick way to say that is this isn't going to work because I'm not Dave. <laughs> and I'm not using Dave's computer. So I download these files to my machines. I do not have this directory on my computer. How do I know I don't have this directory? Well, for one reason, I'm not Dave. For second reason, I have a Mac. Macs don't have no C drives, so it's not going to be able to find that at all. all right? If, however, I use a relative path, then it doesn't matter. The other thing you don't want to do is hot link to an image, unless they explicitly give you permission. And what hot linking to an image would be like, if I were to say, if I were to do, say, a web page about the Cleveland Cavs, uh, and I linked to an image on ESPN's website, and I did something like HTTP colon colon ESPN dot com slash images slash calves dot JPEG. What's wrong with doing that? Why is that not a, not permit? Not I won't say permissible, but it's not good practice. If they change the image, if they, if they get rid of that image or move it, then your page is, is you know, has a broken uh, image. And again, I'm not even talking about the copyright aspect. Of course, that's a problem too. You shouldn't just use people's stuff without giving them credit. But yeah, if they were to move that, that would be a problem. Additionally, in a way, you're stealing a little bit of their bandwidth. You're making their server do a little bit of work to deliver that page. Now. What has happened in the past, believe it or not, is political candidates have hot linked to images on other sites. All right? Which they should know better not to do that, but, you know, they did it. Well, guess what? If I ran a website and a, I found that a political candidate hot linked to one of my images, which is easy to do, right? It's funny, back in the old days of MySpace, so many people used images that I had, like out there on the web, like, uh, yeah, I just take nature pictures or whatever. So many people use those, like, as their backgrounds, that I could have had a lot of fun if I was a malicious person. But I'm not, so I didn't. All right? But what has been done, like, with political candidates is if you found that someone was hot linking to one of your images, you could replace that image with anything you want. So, if it's Jones for president, all right, and they have a picture of the American flag that you took that they thought was good and they hot linked it, you could replace the image of American flag with a sign that says Jones is an idiot or something like that. And without, you know, and without them knowing, all of a sudden their website would have a different image than they thought. So, you don't want to hot link. It, it's, it leaves you vulnerable to things like that. And uh, in addition, you're kind of stealing their bandwidth a little bit. Now, again, for educational purposes, the answer to that would be to download the image from the website. And in the classroom, you're allowed to use that image provided you give credit, like you would give a footnote in a, in a term paper. Questions about any of this? Yes? Or 
Well, the mechanics of it's the same, right? You know, um, regardless of a million, you know, the way that you define your directories and the way that you use a relative pass and all that, that's the same regardless if you're talking about a website that five people are going to access or a website that a million people are going to access. That being said, if you have a website that's going to have high volume, you're going to, you're going to want to make sure your web server is powerful. All right? And typically, larger sites like that, in addition to having the web server, will have a database server involved. And you're going to want to make sure that that is powerful as well. Sometimes even for very large sites, what they'll have is they'll have uh, load sharing, where actually there are multiple web servers that, you know, it's like tellers in a bank, right? If I have a small bank that, you know, a couple, pe you know, dozens of people visit throughout the day, one line might be fine. If I had a bank where hundreds of people visit it every hour, one line ain't going to do it. So I might have several lines. You can actually do that with web servers where you can have your content spread out across multiple web servers and then people get directed to go to this web server or that web server and it, 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 you know, it, you know, how do you make a cart go faster? Either you get a bigger horse or you get more horses, right? So either you could, you could make sure your web server was more powerful or you could employ multiple web servers. So the mechanics that I'm talking about here really doesn't relate anything to the amount of traffic it gets. Now, to be sure, those are issues, but it's not really relevant to, to like, this sort of discussion. Yeah, well, well um, I'll give you some thoughts of it, um, uh, my thoughts on it, because, again, I'm not, you know, I don't want to endorse one uh, thing or another. Obviously, it depends on your background and what you want to do. Many web hosting companies will serve the role as your domain registrar and your web hosting company. Like for example, GoDaddy does that. You go in, you can register your domain with them, and you can get your web hosting space for them. You don't have to do that. You could go in and register your domain one place and have another place for the hosting, but some people like the convenience of, you know, the one-stop shop. I can go and do that. Now GoDaddy has some like canned content that you can have where you can just go and you can customize stuff and they give you templates that you can work with and, and so on and they give you some tools to do that. That may be important to you, that may not be important to you. If for example you knew something about web design but you didn't necessarily want to spend hours working on your website, that might be a good thing All right, to have those templates because then you could just go in and customize stuff, whatever. All right. Um, so that would be something too, but again, you'd have to look at the individual situation. A, a key thing in my mind is um, the, the service that you get, the customer service. So, you know, you can find out of that via word of mouth or bulletin boards or whatever. You know, the company that I belong to, uh, or I don't belong to, but the company that, I, that hosts some of the sites I do, I am very happy with their customer service. In other words, if I have a problem, they work it out very quickly for me. And for where I am at, I'm developing my own code, all right? Um, I don't mind registering my domain somewhere else and hooking up with them. I don't mind doing that kind of work. What's critical for me is the performance I get, um, how, how, how up it is, you know, does the server crash all the time and the web server's not accessible or whatever. And most importantly, if there's a problem, do they address it quickly? So. That would be, for me, customer service would be a, a, a big thing. Um, now, that probably is a function of the fact that, that I, you know, the, the company I use is not that gigantic of a company, all right? It's, it's not like, it's not as big as, say, GoDaddy is, right? You know, if you were to call, um, you know, if you were to call uh, the corner store versus calling Microsoft, you're bound to get a quicker answer from your corner store than you would from Microsoft, simply because, you know, less customers, they can, they can, the advantage that a smaller company gives that they can give you that sort of individual care and they can, they can address your problems quickly. So it really depends on like the project that you're working on and what is most important to you. Um, a small consideration would be like in terms of growing it. 
In other words, you know, I may have plans for a certain amount of traffic now, but I may have goals of increasing that traffic. What company will allow me to get there without having to redo stuff or whatever? T typically, web, web hosting companies provide you those kind of logs, and it's just a matter of going in and looking at them. I mean, you don't need a particular skill, just, you just, which link to click on. And it'll tell you, you know, you know, it'll show you a graph. Similar to, I don't know, anyone has a YouTube channel. You know, uh, if you have a YouTube channel, it will show you, you know, X number of people visited your, your YouTube channel over the past week. Um, here's the most popular videos on your YouTube channel. They, it gives you statistics like that. I, I, I do have a number of people following on YouTube. The interesting thing is like if you go into YouTube and like type database design, it's like I'm like one of the top couple of people that turn up. I, I think what happened is I was like, like many other, um, like, like other things, I don't know if what I did is necessarily better. Okay, that's a little bit of false modesty, but uh, I, I think I put my videos out there probably before a lot of other people put their educational videos out there. So because of that, I kind of got to jump on people. But yeah, especially in terms of database design. Uh, there's a handful of my lectures that are very, very popular because they cover the, the, the fundamentals of it. And apparently they do it in, in a clear way. I get a lot of positive feedback for that. That's a good topic. I mean, some of the other things don't translate as well. Like I've done, I've, I have like Android stuff out there. But I don't know. I don't know if that is... That's first of all, it's a very specific sort of thing, and and secondly, I don't know if that translates to a video as well as say basic database design does. Other questions? You had your hand up over here. Uh, yeah. Um, can you access files on a different Yes. What you can do is is you can make what's called a virtual directory. So in other words. Let's say this is my root directory. If it's underneath the root directory, that's fine. It's still part of the root scheme. But I could have a directory way off here somewhere. All right. It wouldn't really be another root directory, but it would be off somewhere else. It could even be on another drive. What I will do is that what you can do within a web server is you can make what's called a virtual directory. And you can point that virtual directory to wherever that physical directory lives. And a virtual directory is where you say, well, I got these files that are way off here somewhere. Let's pretend they're underneath the root. And this is the name we're going to use when we pretend that they're underneath the root. And then it acts from the web server's perspective or, or from the outsider's perspective just like they were really there. But really they're somewhere else and in, in your, you're just pointing to them. Other questions? All right, your project. This is a good segue into your project. I'm going to take a minute to talk about the requirements of the project. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the process of this. All right. Keep in mind, you know, when, when you were in grade school and you were learning math, you know, a lot of times a teacher would ask to show your work. And sometimes that frustrates students, right? Because it's like, well, I know the answer. Why do I have to show the work? In case no one ever explained to you why you have to show the work, here's why you have to show the work. All right? You have to show the work because it's all fine and good if you know the answer to that question. So if, you, if someone asks that question again, you know the answer to it. All right? But you're going to be asked more questions and you're going to be asked more difficult questions. Therefore, in addition to learning the answer to that specific math problem, your teacher wants to make sure that you've learned the process of how to solve a math problem. So by showing your work, you're showing that, hey, not only can I figure out the answer to this question, but I've learned techniques so when I get a big giant math problem, I can figure that one out too. All right? And that's really what the web development process is. We're doing just a small website here. All right? But the process that we have applies just as well if you're doing a larger website. 
So even though you might say, well, why do I have to go through this? I could just sit down and bang out five or six web pages and be done with it. Yeah, that's true. And, and maybe it would be okay for this project. But if you got involved in a larger project then, and you tried to bang out 100, 200 pages without some sort of planning in advance, you're probably going to end up with some sort of mess. So therefore, we teach the process, and I want you to go through this process. All right, let's look at the handouts. Notice with the project, first of all, you have two phases to it, two portions of it. You have the design and you have the completed project. Think of the design as being the plan for the project. It would be kind of like an outline or a rough draft if you were talking about a term paper. The completed project then is the finished project. It would be the completed term paper. So, this is due July 14th, which is a little more than two weeks. Pretty much two weeks exactly, right? And the final is due in pretty much four weeks, a little bit more than four weeks. Let's look at the project design. I have an overview, a design, and a finish. Let's look at the overview first. I'm not going to read this to you, but we will hit the high spots. This is meant to be open-ended, and you're meant to pick a topic that you're going to enjoy. Um, it makes sense for students to pick their own topic for this. Um, because part of this, in addition to knowing the technical stuff of HTML, is about like developing content and, and developing content that is going to be meaningful to you users. And so therefore pick something that you know something about. And pick something that you enjoy. You know? Um, it's motivational, right? If I were to assign topics to you, um, and you know, I'm able to pick something that you're not interested at all in and it's going to be drudgery. And you're going to just try to get it done. Whereas if it's something that you're interested in, it might actually motivate you to go beyond what's required in this class. I'll give you a great example. A student of mine did, a few years back, did a website about his motorcycles. Well, if you think about it, his motorcycles, yeah, those are like his babies, right? He's not going to put his babies on an ugly web page, right? He's going to make sure the web page looks good um, just for that reason. So that was a motivating factor for him. Plus, it's something he knew about. He didn't have to go to the library and get a book about motorcycles. He already knew about motorcycles and his motorcycles, so it wasn't like a chore to figure out content. He already knew it. All right, so it was a good situation. One po possible pitfall that some students run into is either picking a topic that is either too broad or too narrow. Usually the, the problem that people run into is picking one that is too broad. Rarely you'll see a student come up with something that's too narrow, but that is possible as well. The nice thing is that no matter what topic you're talking about, there's always ways to narrow it down to make it the right size for this project. 
For this project, the final project could contain six to eight pages, each containing a reasonable amount of content. So for example, if I said that I wanted to do a if I wanted to do a, a, a site about tourist attractions in the United States, that's pretty broad, right? What are some ways that you could narrow that down, tourist attractions in the United States? Water parks? So you could take a particular kind of tourist attraction. What's another way you could narrow it down? R regional? Yeah. I know there's not the whole United States, but tourist attractions in Ohio or in the Midwest or whatever. What's another way that you could narrow it down? Free? That's a good. Just pick one and do detail about that. Absolutely. Any other way? Maybe you could consider a certain demographic, for example, tourist attractions for single people, for married people, for people with a family, and so on, you know. Um, the point is, is that if you start off with an idea, if it turns out to be too broad, there's always ways to narrow it down. And there's ways to broaden it as well, you know. <laughs> for example, if you were going to do your web project on... Um, let's say it's almost hard to think of something too narrow, you know. But if you're going to do your project on um, Elsie's Fitness Center, all right. Well, okay, they, maybe you could squeak out six to eight pages, but you might have to broaden that. In which case, you might talk about the fitness center. Maybe, maybe you brought that to be staying fit as a Lorain Community College student. And you could talk about the fitness center, or you could talk about like places that you could walk around here for exercise, like um, Sandy Ridge or French Creek. Or you could talk about you know, bicycle paths that are in the area, or so on. So there's always ways that you could expand or narrow a topic to hit that magic six to eight page range. Picking a topic isn't enough, all right? What you want to do is, oh, we'll get into that in a minute. Oh, actually, we'll get into that now. One of the things you want to do is also, in, in addition to picking your topic, considering like a target audience. So again, the fitness is sort of an example. Instead of doing a fitness site, maybe a site for fitness for Lorain County Community College students. That way you've narrowed down your, your audience, right? You're now not talking about every single person in the world and trying to come up with fitness tips for them. You're talking about a specific group of people, all right? And the more specific you can make it, the better you can address the needs uh, of that group. The goal of the project is to create a site that is technically sound, all right? In other words, the HTML is written correctly. The links work. The images work is well designed, and it effectively communicates the intended message. Two deliverables, a document, a design document, prototype, and the final deliverable. I didn't want to do that. document, pretty easy. Give me the six to eight pages and all the related files and I'll grade it. I'll grade it based on these criteria, which are the very three criteria I mentioned. The user and organizational goals are served. The project sets out, does what it's set out to do. It communicates effectively the content of the site. Principles for good design are followed. And finally, the code is technically sound. So 
Those are the three things I mentioned in the overview. That's what you're graded on. The design. Your, divide, your, your design is divided into five categories. And this is where we're going to start spending a lot of time talking about this. Strategy, scope, structure, wireframe, and prototypes. So we'll talk about each of these steps individually. Whole idea of planning is to have an idea of where you're going to go before you take off, right? Does that mean that your plan is rigid and you're never going to change it? Of course not. Let's say I was planning on driving to Columbus. I might figure out a plan on how to get there. You know, I'm going to go, well, how would I get to Columbus? I'll go south on 58 and then go on whatever that road is in Ashland and then go south on 71, all right? Yeah, that's, that's a good plan, right? Now, of course, what if I find out that there's construction on 58 or that, um, you know, there's construction on 71? or that the weather's going to be really bad today. Or I find out that there is a chocolate festival that's just 15 miles to the east of 71 or something like that, right? So with new information, I might change my plans a little bit, all right? That doesn't mean you go in without a plan, right? You don't want to say, well, let's see, I'm going to get my car and start driving, let's see what we run into on the way to Columbus. And I hope I'm heading in the right direction. I think it's south from here. I'm just going to take off and see what I get. So a plan isn't carved in stone. You can change a plan if you get new information or if you figure out a better way to do something. But it at least gives you a, a starting point that you can base it off of. The whole thing is um, one of the guys uh, on the woodworking show on TV, maybe Norm, Abrams, so always says, what, measure twice, cut once, right? Spend the time figuring out what you're going to do and then go and do it. And you'll be in better shape, all right? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to plan, all right? The further along you get in a software development project, whether it be a web development project or anything else, the expense to make a change gets higher and higher. The graph looks like this. And this has been true since day one of software development. And it's still true, and I suspect it will always be true. The graph looks like this. And this is the cost to make a change. And this is the stage of the project that you find that you have to make the change. So early on the line, when you're planning out the project, if you decide, hey, I need to do something different, you haven't done much yet. So it doesn't take much time or effort or cost to undo it and do something else. If I'm past the planning stage and I'm in the coding stage and I decide, hey, I need to redo something, yeah, I've put a little bit forth of effort in. I have to undo some stuff and so on. It becomes a little bit more expensive through testing, Implementation, finally when the site is live. At the point when the site is live, you find out that you made a big mistake and you have to go back and redo something, that's very costly to do. All right? Think of it like building a house. If I build a house and I say I want one bathroom, all right, 
And if I sit there and think about it a bit and say, well, wait a minute, I probably need two bathrooms. It's going to add some cost if I decide to do that early in the game. However, if I wait until I've already moved into the house, then adding a bathroom is going to be much more expensive. Because I'm going to have to tear down walls. I'm going to have the inconvenience of living with, you know, all this construction going on, and so on and so forth. So the idea in software development is to spend a lot of time planning. So you have a really good plan in mind. Not a plan that's carved in stone, not a plan that you're not going to change, but you have a good idea of what you're going to do first, and then you go out and do it. The hope is that that will cut down on these sort of expenses. Now, the other reason why you plan things out is oftentimes when you develop software, you're, or specifically websites, you're working as part of a team. In other words, you might not be the only person doing the website. You might have other web developers. You might have someone who's responsible for doing database stuff and someone who's responsible for doing graphic design. You might have the user group, the people that you're developing the website for. You know. So for example, if someone from Lorraine Community College came up to me and says, Mike, we need you to redesign this website. Well, I wouldn't develop a plan on my own, right? I need to communicate with the other people that work for LC who are responsible, like what it is I was planning on doing. So that they can say, yeah, that's a great idea, or well, no, you forgot about this, that, and the other. All right? So because of that, because of that, it's important that you document your design. It's important to spend the time to come up with a plan, and it's important you document the plan. Number one, so you can share it with people. You can show it to other people that are on the design team. Number two, because... How do I want to put this? No matter how good your memory is, or how good you think I got it all planned out up here is that doesn't work very well. You're going to forget about stuff and you know. When you put stuff down on paper that's really a good way to make your thoughts tangible and fleshed out as opposed to sort of these vague notions that are floating around in your head. Alright? So that's the reason you document it. So we're going to go through the five step process that we go through to design a web page and we're going to talk about what you're going to include in all five of these steps. All right? And that's the design document or the plan and that's what's due in two weeks. First of all, let's proceed this discussion by me asking the question, what makes a good website? What makes a well-designed website? Okay? Alright, how about this? Can someone define a website that they like? Amazon. Amazon. Alright. Let's pull it up and look at it. What do you like about it? Okay. Okay. The ability to search and find a lot of stuff. Let me let me try to rephrase that and and see if you because I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I want to try to rephrase things. Amazon is a great website to go to because I'm easily able to find a lot of products that I might want. Okay? So I can find the stuff that I want pretty easily. 
And what's more, it's not like they have two or three of a certain item or on a certain topic. They got a lot. So for example, I might pick a topic that's pretty obscure. All right. Let me pick cross-country skiing. Go to our bookstore in College Center. How many cross-country skiing books do you think they have? Two? Two? If you're lucky. <laughs> Go to the library. How many cross-country skiing books do you have? One, if you are lucky. Go to Barnes & Noble's in Crocker Park or Oberlin College's bookstore or whatever it's called at Ben Franklin's in Oberlin, the used book section. All right? How many do they have? One if you're lucky. All right. Cross country skiing here. Cross country skiing. Basic illustrated cross country skiing. A cat that cross country skis. <laughs> I don't know if I want to count that or not. I think I do want to count that. <clears throat> cross country skiing. Stride and glide. <coughs> Nordic notes. Fitness cross-country skiing. Cross-country skiing, dry land drills and fundamentals. All right? Substantially more than that. So Amazon, why do you... And it's an interesting thing here because someone might say, well, it's not really a thing of the website. Well, yes, it is. It's their organization. It's what their organization does right is that they give you, through their website, access to a vast range of products that you can easily find. All right. So the content on this site and the products that are available makes the site good. There's a saying, content is king, content is queen, depending on how you want to phrase it. But people don't come to your website to admire your brilliant design work. That's pretty rare that people do that. All right. Typically people come to your website because they want some information, they want to order a product, they want the answer to some question. Now your design, to be sure, comes into play, right? Because if they didn't have this nice little search and, and things like that, having a million cross-country skiing books isn't going to do you any good, right, if you can't find them. But they allow a mechanism that you can find that. Plus, notice also they have show results for and you might think, well, yeah, in addition to cross-country skiing, I'm interested in, what do they call that, uh, where you put the big things on your feet, um, snowshoeing, all right? Yeah, let me look at that, too. And then you go from there. So content is critical. And the design that you make should support that content. Someone else pick a site that they like. No one likes any websites. YouTube. Pardon me? YouTube. YouTube. And why do you like this? Entertaining? So you go to the web, you go to YouTube. What do you typically go to YouTube for? For music, all right? So in other words, you go there and your goal is to be entertained on one level. Your goal is to listen to music to be more specific. And you're able to find that. So, you know, pick something that you might be interested in. Let me think. David Byrne and Richard Thompson. I was a fan of both of those people for years. I never knew they performed together until I found out, found videos on YouTube. All right? I swear, if you go into YouTube and search, you could probably find your kindergarten Christmas recital in there if you look hard enough, right? Because it seems like everything is out there. So again, good content. Good way to get it. And what's more, in both cases, 
is coming back to goals. All right? I want to find books about a certain topic. And I want a choice between those books. I just don't want to find just whatever one book they have. Amazon provides me that. I want to listen to music. And maybe I want to listen to not just the ordinary stuff that you hear on the radio all the time, because I could just turn on my radio for that. I have something very specific I want to listen. And YouTube has that too. So there's a lot of content, and I can find it easily. All right? In both cases, my goals as a user are being served. All right? Another example of a website you like. Reddit. All right? I learned early on in the teaching game of technology that whenever you go to a website, you turn off the screen for a second, just in case you typo or just in case on whatever site happens to be is something that you don't want the class to, to share, to share with the class. But, pardon me? You never know what's in the advertising. Uh, you never know what you could see on YouTube. You never know. You read. Amazon I feel pretty safe about, but still, what if you spell that wrong? Oh, boy. I, I like my dean a lot, but I don't want a visitor under those circumstances. You know why that came up uh, in, during my class. And that was published to YouTube. All right. What do you like about this? all the content. Again, we're, we're sort of beating a dead horse here in a way, but every one of you folks have said the same thing. And that is, and what do you, what do you come to here for? Okay, the web development section. Okay, the learning programs. All right, so in this case, it has educational content. All right, so this has educational content. All right, why do you go here as opposed to somewhere else? What's specifically... It's all user generated. And what does that mean to you? Okay. Okay. All right. All these are good things. The bottom line is this provides the kind of content that is being looked for. It's different than opening up a textbook, right? It supplies different content. It's user generated. You can ask a specific question, you can get a specific answer. Now, here's the interesting thing all three cases, it kind of comes down to we like these sites because they give us good content, number one. And secondly, we can find the content easily. That's number two, right? Because if you can't find the content easily, then it's almost the same as the content not being there, right? I mean, what good is it, you know? I've heard people say this before about horribly designed websites that they've done. You know, someone complains and says, this website is horrible. I tried to find out X, Y, Z, and the person's like, oh, it's, it's, in, it's on our website, here you go. And they, da, 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 da. It's like, yeah, you that designed the website can find it. No one else in the world can, all right? Whereas with these sites, the content is there, and it's easy to find. Now, here's an interesting thing, and here's, here's sort of my theory on web design. Not, not theory so much, but my observations on web design. Notice what people didn't say, all right? I heard no one say, I like that site because it uses a good font, all right? Right. I like that site because the colors were good. I like the site because the, you know, the background image was good or something like that, all right? Does that mean those things are not important? No. It doesn't mean those things are not important, right? The right font does what? Helps us be able to read the material. The right font does what? Helps us be able to logically group the page and maybe understand that this is the most important, this is the second most important, this stuff over here is a little different than this stuff over there. So color, font, and all that are important but they are of a secondary importance, all right? And what's of primary importance then? 
of primary importance is satisfying the goals of your user. Now, I said in, in these cases, um, it comes down to content, all right? In other cases, it might not be, uh, I guess on some level it's going to be content, but um, whatever the goals of the users are, satisfying them are what is most important. All right? So what does that mean? That means that the content has to be there and it has to be organized in a way that makes it easy to find. So, some places if you start talking about web design, they'll right away start talking about the fonts and the colors and all that. In my mind, that would be like talking about developing an automobile. And like, okay, we're going to teach you to be automobile engineers. All right. Well, here's this nice sheet of, shade of green that people seem to like. And here's a shade of yellow that's really nice and so on. Not to say it isn't true. Not to say it won't give some appeal to your car. But that certainly isn't the most critical part of engineering a car, right? What's the most critical parts of engineering a car? You know, safety, um, gas mileage, reliability. All those things are really what people really need in a car. Some of those other things are sort of window dressing. And not to say that the appearance isn't important, but it's sort of secondary important. So the first thing we're going to do when we design a website is we're going to identify the goals of the user. Here's where the more specific you can be, the better off you are. Alright? <coughs> <coughs> You know, every website, every e-commerce type website, if they still use that term anymore, e-commerce, the goal is to like sell people products and have people find the products that they want. Yeah, that's a goal. But that's really not specific enough. For example, how many of you have ever, have ever purchased an automobile online? Don't laugh. I know people that have. Pardon me? Really? Yeah, like through eBay or whatever. Craigslist. Craigslist? Yeah. You know? So, yeah. <laughs> so, it's not unheard of, but if I were to go to, let's say, who's a car dealership? Spitzer. All right? Spitzer's car dealership page. Am I going to expect it to be like Amazon? Where I can go and I can click add to shopping cart. Uh, <laughs> 2015, uh, you know, Chevy whatever. Or 2015 Ford whatever or Toyota whatever. No. What's the purpose of a website in that case? Yeah, they're selling stuff just like Amazon selling stuff. But what's the difference in that case? What's the goal of the organization in that case. What's my goal as a user in that case? Showcasing inventory? For, to what end? Bring to bring you in. <laughs> Alright. We, we could talk about it in more detail, but ultimately the goal of an automobiles dealership website is to get you on the floor of a car dealer. <laughs> so the guy in the plaid coat <laughs> can work his magic and what can I do to get you in this car today kind of thing, right? That's the goal. Now, I never worked for a car dealership site, but I worked for a jewelry site, all right, uh, uh, K Jewelers. I did work on their website ages ago. And it was the same thing. The thought was is that it, people that buy jewelry like that aren't going to like necessarily order like top of the line really good jewelry online, right? Because you want to see it. You want to look at it, you know. You don't necessarily want to look at a picture of it because who knows how the picture's been altered or whatever. You want to see it in person. So <clears throat> you couldn't order off the site. The, the goal again was the same. 
the goal of the customer then is to gather enough information to decide whether they want to make a trip to that store or visit Spitzer or visit car dealership B or whatever who looks like they have the best selection, the best prices and so on. So in both cases, loosely speaking, visitor to Amazon, visitor to a car dealership site has the same goal. They want to buy something. But in reality, if you look in a little more detail, you find that they have very different goals. All right? One person wants to buy something now. One person wants to educate themselves on that particular dealership to decide if they want to go in and do a visit. All right? So that's why it's important to think specifically about those goals because that's going to have an impact on how you um, that's going to have an impact on how you proceed and how you do the rest of the design. So, your first step is identify goals. There are going to be goals for your users and there's going to be goals for your organization. Ideally, these goals are going to complement each other. In other words, they're not going to be totally the opposite of each other. Right? There's going to be at least some common ground. You know, on its most fundamental level, Amazon wants to sell you something, you want to buy something. Hey, there's some common ground. All right? Second thing to keep in mind is that not all users have the same goals. All right? Users have slightly different goals depending on you know what sort of user they are. I had a student here that said they go to YouTube to watch music videos. Does anyone else and so in in a, in a broader sense they go to YouTube to be entertained. Is there anyone that goes to YouTube for other reasons? Yes. To learn. To learn. All right. So there's people that want to learn going to YouTube. There's people that want to entertain going to YouTube. All right. So not everyone has the same goals when they visit a site. Let's think of a great example of this. Any college website. All right. And again, we can talk about... LC's website, we could talk about Cleveland State's website, they all have the same sort of, um, they're all in the same environment. Alright? What are diff different groups of people that would visit Lorraine Community College's website? Or different groups of people? Current students, Current students is one. Alright? Who's another group of people? Future students. Future students or potential students. You know, I guess you could, I guess those actually future and potential students might even be different groups of people, right? I may know I'm coming here. That's one thing. I may think I might come here. That's another. And they may have different goals. All right, what's another group of people? Alumni. All right, another group. Parents of students. Parents of students. Absolutely. Professors. Professors. Staff. Let's think, uh, and, and we could probably come up with more even, like members of the community. All right? In other words, you might just want to know what's going on at Stocker. You might want to visit the library. You know, you don't, don't intend on taking classes here, but there's a lot of other things that go on here that aren't specifically relating to classes. Members of businesses. They may, you know, businesses might want, for example, and a lot of businesses do this, might want to contract for custom training on a particular topic. Gee, I want to train all my sales reps in Excel. I don't know how to do that. I'm not particularly an Excel expert. I'm not a teaching expert. And besides, I got too much time to be, or I don't have enough time to begin with. So yeah, we'll go and we'll, we'll contract some training or we'll see if there's some non-credit courses available. All right? So... Thing to keep in mind is, especially when you get in the larger sites, there's going to be different groups of people visiting the site. 
And each group is liable to have their own slightly different goals. Now in some cases the goals may be slightly different, in other cases the goals might be a lot different. But what one thing we want to do is we want to identify who the different groups of people visiting our site are. And the technique we're going to use is we're going to create what are called personas. All right? This is something that sounds a little corny at first, but it really, I think, is an important sort of technique to use. Personas are representations of different kinds of typical users. So, in the case of a college website, we have current user or a current student. future student, prospective student, faculty, parents, and so on. Even among those groups, we could probably break them down even further, right? There are quote, traditional age college students and there are, quote, non-traditional college students. There are people that are planning career changes or transitioning from one career for another versus someone who is a recent high school graduate that's continuing their education in the higher education. All right? With personas, what you do is you actually make up people, make up pretend people, and you write a little backstory for them. All right. It's your chance to explore your skills as a writer, if nothing else. All right. So you might say, George Smith, 22-year-old, CISS web development major, high school grad, and so on. You make up a little, little story about them. In some cases I've even seen where people like will clip, will get like stock photos and put a photo associated with them. Now why go to all that trouble? Alright? Why do all that? Sounds kind of corny. Why bother with that? Put yourself in that person's shoes. Exactly. So often, in the terms of software development and web development, we hear developers talk about the user as though the user was one person or one type of person that is accessing their website and doing stuff on it. That's not true. There's not one person. There's, there's a lot of different kinds of people. Now to be sure, even this is generalizing a bit, right? Because not every college student has the same background. Not every future student has the same background. But I'll tell you what, it's better to think of your users in terms of a half dozen groups than it is to lump all of them together into one group. All right? So therefore you come up with these things and as you're developing your website you think would this design of the website work for this person? Would it work for this person? And so on down the line. Let me see if I can come up with an example from the web of a persona. And again, at first glance, sometimes it looks, it looks kind of funny and goofy. But again, it's exactly an exercise in empathy. You define certain groups of people who are visiting your site. 
Not representing everyone in the whole world, but you can't develop 7 billion personas, but you develop a certain set of them, and then you say, will this design work for this person? In this case, this site is for, the site that this is defined is for Brandy. <laughs> and Brandy, what is her characterizing quality? Poor Brandy has narrow feet. And Brandy has a hard time finding shoes that fit her. All right. And here's a little backstory. Why is Brandy going to visit a site? Because a lot of re retail sho shoes don't have shoes that fit her narrow feet. Just like a cross-country skier can't find the books that they're interested in in a regular bookstore. So Brandy can't find the selection of shoes she's interested in in a regular store, so she's going to shop online. Would like to purchase several pairs, right? If you have a hard time getting yourself fitted for something, what is a good strategy? Find something you like and get 10 of them, <laughs> right? Different colors and so on. And, and so on. So here's a little persona about this. So if you're designing a site for a shoe store, this might be one of your personas, and your design ought to be able to accommodate this person's needs. And you can sort of use this as sort of a, what do I want to say, a, uh, um, a litmus test for your design. In other words, one of the things here, would like to purchase several pairs of shoes, several pairs to fit occasion, style, and color. So in other words, that's kind of almost like the feature in Amazon where you search for something and it says, gee, people that bought the Beatles White Album also bought such and such. In this case, it would be people that bought this shoes, which is 4A width, all right, also found this pair in 4A width. And if you have a hard time finding shoes, that, might, that particular feature might be pretty good for you. We'll continue with this on next time. We'll go through and we'll wrap up the design section next time. We will then transition into, okay, we came up with this great design, how do we actually make it work? And we'll start covering the CSS and HTML and add to our toolbox of techniques to make that work. Questions? Yes? Ah, great point. One thing that a student had uh, an issue with last time is that their ID, they started the ID with, their, with a number, and the CSS code didn't work for it. Apparently, you can't start an ID with a number. All right? So, you know, you can use words, but you can't use numbers. I actually used a validator, an HTML validator, to find that problem because I stared at it and it just did not make sense to it, to me why it was. And again, I remember hearing that years ago, but I just never used IDs that start with numbers. So I, I forgot that that was a problem. We will, in a future um, instance of class, future um, class session, talk about validators. And if anyone runs into a problem in lab or something doesn't work the way they want it to, remind me and I can show you how to use a validator um, to solve that. Again, the, the importance is less how to solve this particular problem, but learning that skill of using a validator. All right. Okay. We'll see you in lab.